Good morning, folks. It's a big news day. Our store reopens. The long-awaited PDF copy of the textbook is available today only, but we've also got the sun, quakes, and we'll begin answering the question of what it will take for the sun to end modern civilization. Let's start with our star at spaceweathernews.com, and we find the last 24 hours calmer than the eruptive day before. Coronal hole turning out on the north, and we're actually in an eruption watch for the plasma filament up there behind it. There were two filaments up north and the trailing rope ripped away already. We saw that yesterday. The second one is out ahead turning through earth-facing heliographic longitudes. These filaments settle in dark regions here in 171 angstroms, even while the coronal hole top right cannot be seen. Alas, if it remains stable today, this filament should be moving out of earth-facing position. The solar wind has been moderately intense. The second component of the stream reinvigorated geomagnetic storms and instability that continues this morning. Folks, the earthquake watch period ramped up quickly, didn't it? If you recall, it was the solar polar magnetic fields indicating this uptick was afoot, Chile taking the highest rumbles, but certainly a more active Earth as a whole the last day. As you can see, the motion of the Chile quake was captured by some still awake, burst pipes near an elevator shaft, grocery store shelves rolled back and forth. Daylight will soon reveal if the region sustained any other damage in the event. This morning, the remnants of last night's central state storms are puffing out, but that region is going to light up again tonight. Eyes open there. Okinawa feeling the typhoon ultimately heading for South Korea, next one already in development near Mariana. Let's go out to space and find the first observations of magnetic fields feeding material to a stellar surface. This is a critical step in the science started by Sophia indicating in 2018 that magnetic fields and plasma turbulence were controlling forces in stellar formation scenarios. The feeding of material through magnetic fields is how a considerable fraction of space weather and cosmology work. Up next, the University of Colorado has used electron beams to form an electrostatic dust buster for the moon. They are in the early stages of what you'd call controlling the event, but proof of concept is not only real, but this is a confirmation of much of what Billy has done in our plasma lab. In fact, Billy has made features seen on Mars, the moon, and even in the desert southwest of the USA. One of my favorites is how the electric wind looks like cloudbursts, microbursts, sandstorms, derechos, roll clouds, etc. Yelverton Plasma Lab is available for members at suspiciousobservers.org, by the way. Moving on to the science, we begin with a magnetic excursion that was so severe it can be picked out in the data from 3.8 million years ago. For the most part, when you get much past the last 120,000 years, the excursions are harder to see. But what could better exemplify the changing severity of this event than some seeming barely visible from 20 to 30,000 years ago while others seem to endure in their evidence for millions of years? Up next, a paper suggesting that not only does the sun control climate change, but so does the moon and a number of planets, notably Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus here. In the same vein of controlling the terrestrial climate, we find a solar control over major hydrological cycles. Not a new thing, but certainly the most creative title for such studies I've ever seen. We also have a more usual type of solar forcing study, particle forcing, geomagnetic storm activity, tied to long-term climate change oscillations, and it's a critical difference from the irradiance-only models. Now, last but not least, folks, we can use a recent study confirming the DST level of the September 2017 geomagnetic and ionospheric storms to see what it would take to collapse the global grids today. The 1859 Carrington event storm here at Earth was 7 to 10 times greater than the 2017 storm DST, and the 1859 event indeed is considered a grid collapse scenario. But the estimated flare magnitude of the Carrington event is about X45. I have heard as low as X25, but either way, a titanic eruption. The 2017 storms occurred due to CMEs from a few X-class flares, but using the DST is better because it's the storm severity, automatically including the weaker Earth field. So looking at the X-ray Watts chart, it actually appears that when we get above the X10 level now, we could already be entering that Carrington damage range, even if such an event would still be tremendously short of what the 1859 event actually was on the Sun, but our field was stronger back then. We do average an X10 solar flare per solar cycle, 
The magnetic field continues to weaken. The control of the sun on the weather, climate, technology, and human health will continue rising, and we march towards that magnetic excursion. You can learn about all of that in Weatherman's Guide to the Sun, 3rd edition. Today, the PDF is available for those who had prohibitive shipping costs for the four-pound textbook. Over 300 pages, 500 citations, from the light of the sun to the end of the world. The whole store at otf.sales.com is back, so the hard copies are available again too, along with a number of our merchandise items. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind maps and shots of our star to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now, it's 5 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.